In this video, I'm going to break down the Redshift camera object. One thing to note is if you're converting a project from an older version of Cinema 4D, you'll have to maintain the previous workflow that utilizes the Redshift camera tag. The Redshift camera object doesn't work properly in scenes created in earlier Cinema 4D releases. The way that Redshift now works is you have to have the Redshift renderer selected in your render settings in order for all of the options to be available within Cinema 4D. So before you do anything, make sure that Redshift is selected as your renderer. Otherwise, when you click the camera object, you're gonna get a standard Cinema 4D camera and not a Redshift camera. So I think that's important to note. So I'm on one of my cameras that I've already set up, but I am going to create a new camera by clicking the camera icon here in the menu. This will create a new Redshift camera. I'm going to select that. So now I'm viewing through this new Redshift camera. If I go down to my attributes menu, we can start walking through these various different parameters. Camera types. In this menu, we can change the perspective of our camera. For a normal camera perspective, select perspective. The perspectives fisheye spherical, cylindrical, and stereospherical simulate very wide angle lenses or even perspectives that cannot be captured with real cameras. These perspectives can be useful for creating panoramic renderings or VR environments, for example. Left, right, front, back, top, or bottom represent the standard viewing directions and perspectives of the 3D viewports. When switching to orthographic perspective, the camera uses a parallel perspective compared to the standard viewport viewing directions. The difference is that the camera can still be freely placed and rotated in space. The isometric perspective offers a fixed camera perspective and results in equally foreshortened axis directions with an angle of 120 degrees between any pair of axes. Finally, the dimetric perspective also offers a fixed viewing direction, but the camera can still be moved. Parallel edges remain visually parallel, and the lengths along the X and Y directions remain proportional. Only the distances along the Z axis appear shortened. Focal length. In a real camera, the focal length represents the distance between the lens and the sensor. The smaller the focal length, the wider your shot will be. The larger your focal length, the more zoomed in your camera will be. Angle of view. The field of view is directly linked to the focal length. The greater the focal length, the smaller the field of view, and vice versa. A small field of view represents a camera with a telephoto lens since only a small portion of the scene to be photographed enters the camera. Field of view changes if the proportion between width and height are modified in the render settings. Shift. This parameter shifts the view of the camera vertically or horizontally without changing the 3D perspective. Sensor size. The sensor of a camera is usually a fixed element that evaluates the light entering the camera. In conjunction with the focal length, the size of the sensor determines the field of view of the camera. In my personal opinion, I'd leave this setting alone and focus on altering others. Let me know if you could think of a good use for this one. I have not thought of one. In a physical camera, the sensor makes a big impact, but not so much in a CG camera, at least as far as I know. Clipping. Use the near clip plane and far clip plane options to specify two distances measured from the camera's position. Only geometry between these distances is evaluated for display and rendering. Exposure type. For EV only, sensitivity, aperture, f-stop, and shutter time, shutter angle will not affect the exposure of the rendering. This way you can use these settings to just control depth of field and motion blur. To brighten or darken the rendering, use the exposure value. For filmic, sensitivity, ISO, aperture, f-stop, and shutter time, shutter angle will work with a regular still or movie camera and not only control depth of field or motion blur, but also the exposure of the rendered image. Exposure. You can use this value to multiply the amount of light in your scene. A value of zero will keep all light intensities untouched. An exposure of one will double the intensity of the light in the scene, while an exposure of negative one will cut all intensities in half. White point. This value will help you alter the white balance of your camera depending on the light source. Vignetting, I feel like it's pretty straightforward. Increase the vignetting value to darken the edges of your image. Focus. The focus settings will help us art direct our bokeh. First, make sure the bokeh option is turned on. You manually set a focus distance, or you can use the picker icon to click on the surface you want to be in focus. Or you can link an object to the object parameter. The camera will keep this object in focus as the camera moves. 
When using an object to determine the focus distance, you can manually tweak this focus distance by entering an offset value. Aperture and Bokeh. The lower your aperture value, the larger your bokeh will be. If you hit the toggle down arrow, this opens up more options to alter your bokeh. Diaphragm. This refers to the shape of the bokeh. Circular will produce a perfect circle bokeh. Bladed imitates physical cameras which have bokehs that are shaped depending on how many blades are installed. Six blades would result in a hexagonal opening rather than a circle. Image allows you to determine a custom bokeh shape based on an image file. For this video, I'm going to skip past the motion blur. I think this needs a full video to get a proper breakdown, but refer to the Redshift documentation if you want more info for now. Distortion. This option allows you to distort your render with an image map created to mimic camera lens distortion. Color correction and lens effects. The color correction and lens effects tabs contain options to control Redshift post effects. You can even set it up so that each camera has its own post effects settings by utilizing the override option. I'm not going to go into the details of each post effects in this video, but I'll circle back in another video if people have questions. Display. In the Frustrum section, you can turn on the focus plane checkbox to see where the focus plane lies in your scene. In the Composition section, you can add grids and overlays to your camera in order to help you direct your camera angles. If you'd prefer to not use the Redshift camera object and revert back to the older workflow, you can change that. Go to your Cinema 4D preferences and under Renderer, click Redshift. Deselect this checkbox in the Redshift preferences. After you've turned this off, restart Cinema 4D. Now when you open up Cinema 4D, make sure you select the Redshift renderer in the render options and then create a new camera, and you'll see that you have a Cinema 4D camera with a Redshift camera tag, which is how the old workflow used to work. So that was a quick breakdown of the new Redshift camera object. I know it's been out for a while, but I've been seeing various questions regarding the camera object on different forums and Slack channels, whatnot. I've also had a couple different questions about it, so I figured I'd do a deep dive on the documentation, make a quick video about it. So hopefully that was helpful. If it was, throw me a like down below, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in the next video.